God does incredible things, and it's so good to see you all today. And aren't you just thankful for this cool weather? Man, I'm telling you what. See, Fred bought a place out of town to go away to get cool weather, and God just said, Fred, you don't have to move away to get it. No, I'm kidding you. I'm only saying that because I'm jealous, <laughs> but it's so good to see all of you today. How many of you have your Bible? Hold up your Bible. Say this with me. This is my Bible. It's the Word of God. I'll do what it says I can do. I'll be what it says I can be. I'll have what it says I can have. I'm going to hear the Word of God today. It's going to change my life. I'm never going to be the same. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm never going to be the same. In Jesus' name. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. Turn with me to the gospel according to Luke, chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 18 and look at some scriptures today. Luke 18, verse 18. And God's going to give us some good stuff today. Get your outline out of your bulletin and a separate sheet of paper. And we're going to talk again today on identity. We've been talking for the last few weeks on identity theft. How many of you know that identity theft is the fastest growing crime in the world? Fastest growing crime in America. Somebody's identity, I think if I, I'm not mistaken, I read recently that someone's identity is stolen every 17 seconds. That, that's, that's a lot. But as we have been learning, your identity is more than your bank account or your credit cards. There's a higher identity that can be stolen, and that's the identity of who you are in Jesus Christ. And Satan, the enemy of our soul, has robbed us and robbed our identity through religion. See, religion tells you, don't think too highly of yourself. The religion says, now, you can't do the things that Jesus really did. He was just talking to the apostles. The fullness of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, that's all passed away. And what happens is we hear religious teaching and religious doctrine and dogma, and we began to believe that instead of what God's Word tells us. Folks, the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same one. Yesterday, today, and forever. And the identity that he had for the apostles, the identity that he had for the early church is the identity that he has for you and I today. And God apostolically is speaking through his apostles, prophets, and pastors in these last days to get rid of and to call out that spirit of religion and cast it off of the church so that we can walk in the fullness that God has for us. Now, this is better preaching than you're acting, but it's still early. I understand. So today we're continuing talking about identity theft. Last, time, last week we talked about being mugged by the mirror. And we learned last week that our identity is not about how we look on the outside, but our identity is how God sees us on the inside. Today we're going to talk about success, and I want you to know that success is a huge robber. You might say, well, you know, success is, isn't, that, isn't that a positive thing? Yes, if your success is in the right thing. So my question to you today is, are you successful? I want you to think about that. Am I successful? But the follow-up question is equally important. What is success? See, there's a lot of people that think they're successful on the outward, and Satan uses that to rob them from an inward success. See, success doesn't come from the outside in. Success comes from the inside out. You can ask any successful person in the world, and they will tell you that. 
You can, you can talk to any business leader, entrepreneur, anyone that, can, that has uh, achieved what they would call success, and they will tell you that if you don't have a successful insight on the inside, the things that look successful on the outside really just don't matter. Now, there, you know, we talk a lot about success today in, in our society, and I read one definition, and I love this. Somebody said, success is making more money than your wife can spend. <laughs> and for a woman, success is finding that man. <laughs> because we look at success from the external. But God wants to wake up in you an internal, an internal, an eternal success. Amen? So today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the thief of success and how it robs us and has robbed us and how we can maintain or retain our identity in Christ Jesus. To most people... Success is defined as whatever validates us. Success to most people is defined as whatever validates us. Whatever offers a sense of significance in our eyes or in other people's eyes. We have diplomas on our walls that say I'm smart. We have trophies on our bookcases that say I'm a champion. We have school polls that declare who's most likely to succeed, who's the king and queen of the prom. In the workplace, we have, uh, we, we have titles that declare our position. We fill out forms that place us in levels of income, marital status, and work history. Because to the world, these are all successful things. And I'm not saying not to achieve these things, but what I am saying is there's got to be more than just that. Cars have luxury models. Airlines have first class. And we feel successful when we have obtained these things. It has often been said, and I think this is true, we, spend up, we end up spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. Have <laughs> you found that to be true? God wants us to be successful, but he wants us to understand and discover what true success is. And that will free us from the deceptive pursuits of the world. The critical issue in life is not that of succeeding, but that of knowing what is truly successful. I like this quote. You might want to write this down. Failure is this. Failure is to succeed at something that doesn't really matter. Failure is to succeed at something that really doesn't matter. And I can add to that, failure is succeeding at things that aren't eternal. Every time in my life when I'm asked to do something or I'm presented with something, I have to ask myself this question. What is this project in terms of eternity? What is this venture in terms of eternity, the mission, uh, the, the the mission of Kern County, several years ago, I've told this story. They they asked me many years ago to go on the board. My first thought was, I don't have time. But then my second question was, how would this position, how would this position, how would it promote? eternity and I had to say yes because I knew the lives of the decisions that I would be making on that board 
not to run the director, not to hold the director under fire, but to come alongside with the vision. And, and in the five years that I was on that board, the last two I served as president of the board, God used that ministry to build a homeless, or excuse me, a women and children's uh, center that we were, we were privileged of raising over a million dollars for that project in nine months. And it wasn't just for that, it was about impacting women and children for eternity. And I'm not, I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on what Jesus did. See, because God told Janae and I when we came here uh, 20 years ago, you're going to have a, a home for women and children. We were looking all around us, and God said, no, I'm not going to have you do it here. I'm going to have you be a part of it in the city. How does it impact the city? How does it impact eternity? That's everything that we have to question. Business people, what is your business doing to impact people for eternity? You don't just provide a service to give you a living. You provide a service that God gives you influence for you to make a difference in people's lives. See, when I first started I th in ministry, when I first came here 20 years ago, I was 38 years old, and I thought success was to build a huge church. I worked 60 hours a week. I neglected my family. I neglected things that I should have been doing that impacted eternity instead of the things that were just impacting what I thought was the kingdom, but was really just making me look better. Come on. And so I had to change my focus. 20 years later, at 58, I'm a little smarter than I was then. Success for me now is not building a big church. Success now is building big people. Numbers that aren't healthy is success that will not impact eternity. Numbers of people that are healthy will impact eternity, eternity in a positive way. See, it's not about following the crowd. It's about following the cloud. It's not about going into success what the world thinks is success. But what does Jesus count as success? Jesus said to Peter, he said what? If you love me, Peter, do what? Feed my sheep. If I love God, if you love God, we have to constantly ask our question, what is, is what I'm doing affecting not just my community here for the good for now, but how will it impact eternity? I love when Fred came on our, our board several years ago. He was the chief financial officer for, uh, for Kern Medical Center. And... Uh, one of the things that they sent out of the county, they said, well, Fred's being promoted to this, and he's on the board of Grace Assembly of God. And I had people go, look, he's part of your church. And I went, glory to God. Why did, why did God promote him? God promoted him because Fred in what he did as a job and what he does in serving board, it's not just for now to impact him and a few people. It will impact eternity. Is the position that God has given you for you? Are you using it for you? Or are you doing it to impact eternity? I saw on Facebook the other day, Allison uh, uh, number one coach in Bakersfield or something like that. And, and, and I'm thinking, isn't it great that God used a Christian woman to be coach of the year? Was it coach of the year? Yeah, coach of the year. See, that's going to impact eternity when people see that Christian witness. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? And there's other people that are successful, not just the plain family, but, but, but you, get, you, you know what I'm talking about. Because we're all in this together. And sometimes I have to step back because I get a little cynical. Oh, I'll be through in just a minute if uh, you guys are bothered. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sometimes I have to step back and say, what am I doing in light of eternity? What am I doing in light of eternity? 
I didn't even plan on saying that, but you know, I'm just going to give that to you. See, because sometimes we work hard and we climb the ladder. And John Maxwell says sometimes we climb the ladder to reach the top to only realize that, we were lean, uh, that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Don't let your ladder be leaning against the, lo- the wrong wall. Climb the ladder that's leaning against God's potential and God's purposes. Amen? Something else I want to drop on you. Success is not a destination. Success is a journey. But for many people, based on a false presumption of success, they're always trying to reach success, which is the wrong kind of success. So at the top of your outline, I want to talk for a few minutes on uh, how to reclaim my identity from the world's idea of success to God's idea for success. Does that sound good? Number one, write this down. I I reclaim my identity when my significance is settled in God. When my significance is settled in God. Very seldom are we ever invited to live out our heart. I'm going to say that again. Very seldom are we ever invited, and we're never invited by the world to live our hearts. But as Christians, God is calling us to live a life out of the abundance of our heart. Now, now a lot of people say, well, that's emotional. Well, let me tell you, when God saved your soul, he also saved your emotions. And there's nothing wrong with being emotional. God created your emotions. God is a feely God. He's a touchy God. He's a loving God. He's a huggy God. And what we've got to do is connect with God's heart so we can live out our heart that's in God's heart. You see, in the world, if we're rich, we're honored for wealth. If we're beautiful, we're honored for our good looks. Now, I've never had that problem, but that's what I've heard. If we're intelligent, we're honored for our brains. So we, we, we lean on offering those parts of our of our lives, and we lead with them for approval. But listen, living out of a carefully crafted performance to gain acceptance from those to respect us in life is leaning up against the wrong... That's the latter leaning up against the wrong wall. Somebody say amen. So many equate success with significance. Jesus said this in Luke 18, 18. I had you turn there. Let's look at it. He said, a certain ruler asked him. Now, we refer to this in the Bible as the story of the rich young ruler. And a certain ruler asked him, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 19, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Verse 20, you know the commands. This is Jesus' response. You know the commands. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and money. And the man answered in verse 21, all of these things I have kept since I was a boy. Now, In other words, what the man was saying is, I've kept the law. I've done everything religion tells me to do. But folks, there was still something unfulfilled in the center of this man's core. Even though he had obtained all of this, he he wanted to know how to inherit eternal life. But he was committed in keeping with his image. See, that's what we do in America. We want to protect our image rather than do what God says to do. Now, now this man, you know, he was young. He was probably handsome. He was well-liked. He was well-dressed. He was probably on the cover of the Mediterranean GQ magazine. He probably wore an Abercrombie toga, Gucci sandals, Am I painting a picture for you here? I'm sure he power lunched at the Jerusalem Athletic Club, drove a nice chariot, and lived in a wonderful hut. But what's my point? 
He looked like he had it all, but inside he didn't have the answers. He was running on empty. He was successful in the world's sight, but he was left wanting more. See, the man was like a lot of us. Success stole from him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? When Jesus heard this, verse 22, he said to him, you still lack one more thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then follow me. And when the man heard this, verse 23, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus say, sell all you have and give to the poor? Now, we know that's not how you inherit eternal life. Uh, what he was saying is to the man, what do you want your identity to be? God is asking us the same question today. What do you want your identity to be? See, the man, his hope, his identity was in the things that he had. That's why Jesus said you need to give it away because I believe that that would have changed his perspective from an identity of what he had to an identity of who he has in Jesus Christ. And I believe that if he would have been obedient and given away everything, God would have just blessed him a hundred times over. But what God was trying to do with this man, what God is trying to do with us is he is asking us the question. He's not sell, asking us today to sell everything we have. Sometimes he just says, give 10%. Why? Because if you can give your 10% or not reveals the condition of your heart and the identity you really have. If you can't tithe, if you can't do the basic things in giving that God says to do, you really need to examine your heart. Is my identity in Christ or is my identity in the things I have? And I want to keep even the ten. Because a man or a woman who is totally engulfed in God and His will and His identity, when God says give it all, they give it all. When God says give 10%, they give 10%. When God says give the hamburger to the guy on the street, they give it because it's not about what they have. It's about what they can give because our identity is in a giving God and we have His DNA. Am I making sense to you? So I've gone over the tithe records, and I want to share them this morning. No, I'm kidding. Boy, I'll tell you, five people almost ran out of the room. I don't look at the tithing records. All I get is numbers. I don't know what you give on paper, but I can tell who gives by looking at their lifestyle. I can be with, a, I can be with somebody for just a few minutes. I can tell whether they're givers or whether they're hoarders. I know if they have the image of Christ or they have the image of what the world's idea is for success. I like what Jesse Duplantis said last week. He was talking about how he was in a mall and a guy ran up to him and said, you're Jesse Duplantis, aren't you? And he goes, yeah. That's what I love about Jesse. He doesn't wear sunglasses and try to go incognito. And the guy handed him $2,000. He said he was walking around the mall by the time, and people were just giving him money. By the time uh, it was uh, towards the end of the evening, he had $14,000 cash. He said, so I thought I'll walk the other end of the mall. And he said, I walked the other end of the mall and didn't get a thing. He said, that's the stingy end, but this is the point. And so he met up with his wife. His wife was shopping. He was looking at the stuff, and, and she said, where'd you get that money? And he said, people just gave it to me. And so she said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go shopping. She said, okay. And so he went, and there was a lady and a couple. They looked like they had just gotten married, and they were looking at a dress in the window. This was Christmas Eve, by the way. And um, they were talking about it, and he overheard the husband say, oh, honey, you'd look good in this. And she said, oh, I know, but we can't afford it. And he goes, no, but someday maybe, maybe, maybe we can. And Jesse heard it, and she, he looked up, and he said, he said, you know, you'd look good in that. 
He said he had gotten so much money that day he had to put it in a, in, in a, in a, a grocery bag. And he said, he said the lady turned to him and said, well, it's $1,100 and I don't have that. And Jesse opened up the bag and said, well, here, take a handful. And bought her the dress. Why? Because Jesse's learned the secret that I'm not here for what I can obtain. I'm here to help people obtain the blessings of God. And it's like Zig Ziglar used to say, if you help enough people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want because it's God's law of giving and receiving. And we've got to live for a bigger identity than the identity of what we have. That's free. I'm not even going to charge you for that. Ephesians 3, 1 through 5 in the message said, How blessed is God. He's the Father of our Master Jesus Christ. Long before He laid down earth's foundation, He had us in mind. He settled us as the focus of His love to be made whole and holy by His love. Long, long ago, He decided to adopt us into His family through Jesus Christ. Wow, that's good. I was with my son yesterday, my son James, he, he works at, uh, at Greenlawn, he's an assistant director, and I was doing a service there, and uh, he was standing there doing his job, he looked so good in his suit, I'm so proud of him, and uh, an, an old pastor friend came up and, hey, how you doing? I said, good, we're talking, we hadn't seen each other in years, and, and uh, in the course of the conversation, he found out that James was my son. And he said, he said, James, he says, Pastor Eddie's your daddy? And, and James said, yeah, yeah, that's my dad. And he said, boy, you got big shoes to fill. And I cringed. I thought, oh, no, don't put pressure on my children. I mean, the man meant it as a compliment, but I'm thinking, oh, how's James going to take that? So, so uh, after the service, I went up to James and I said, I hope it doesn't bother you that people try to do that to you. And, you know, son, you know, I, you, you don't try to live up to me. You, you've got your own destiny. And, and he looked at me and he said, Dad, it makes me happy that you have a good reputation in this city. And, and, and immediately I thought, now that's success. I may not leave my sons and my daughter a lot of riches, but if I can leave them a good name, Come on, if you can leave them a good name, that's better than all the riches you have. Number two, when my ambition, I reclaim my identity when my ambition is centered simply in His glory. What good, Jesus said in Luke 9, 25, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his, whole, and yet lose his soul? Ecclesiastes 4.4 4 says that I observed and most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors, but this too is meaningless, like a chasing of the wind. In Luke 12.15, Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. One of my favorite heroes in American history is in the story of a man named James Cash Penny. He was the son of a Baptist preacher. He wanted to graduate. He graduated high school and he was on to college to become an attorney. His dad died and he had to take a job in a store as a clerk. And his whole plans of life had changed. But it was through that experience that in 1902, he founded J.C. Penney's department store. And he said, if God asks for 10, and if God can operate on 10, I'm going to switch that around. I'm going to give God 90. I'm going to keep 10 for myself. Why was he able to do that? Because his identity was not in the success of his business. His identity was, I belong to God, and how many people can I help? 90% today, well, in his day, he was the largest retailer in America, and he's still going today. And I believe Pennies is still in business today because of the seeds that man sowed 100 years ago. Number three, 
We regain, we regain our identity when faithful matters more than success. When faithfulness matters more than success. And I've got no other stories and things that I can give you that I'm not going to go on today because my time is up. But here's my point. Put your identity in what Christ, what Christ says to do, not in what you and I want to do. If you own a business, make your business about not making money, but how it can help people. And how will it impact eternity? If you don't own your own business and you work for somebody, then ask God how you can touch people for eternity, not to just make a living for yourself. Amen? Father, we pause now to give you thanks for your goodness, your grace, your love, and your mercy. And we ask today, God, that you would touch our hearts. And that God's success would be in following you and your word, not just in making a living for us. And God, I pray that you touch each and every one of us by your power today, that we will have your identity, your DNA. Your word says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Father, when we love, we give. We give our lives to you. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ or you're not sure and you'd like to pray this prayer with me, would you just look up at me so I can see who's praying? Is there anyone? Anybody that wants to rededicate their life and say, God, I want to be, live more for eternity, not just for the now, a lot of us. Father, I just pray right now for those that want to receive Christ, that they call on your name today, and those that want to walk in your destiny, their destiny, by putting their trust totally in you, I pray that you would do it today, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Would you do that today?